Okay. Thank you uh, very much. Bütün organizasyon komitesine çok teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Çok müthiş bir uh, iş çıkarttınız ve çok güzel yürütüyorsunuz. Um, I want to uh, introduce my speech on the raw material I'm going to analyze today. And the raw material is not the uh, archaeological data. It is the ethnological data. Because what uh, we're looking at is a society. And it's uh, a Neolithic society, so it's a proto-agriculturalist. But uh, we're especially going to look at the uh, ideology. And for uh, the ideology, uh, we need to look at the symbolism. Now, every uh, society is, uh, can be uh, conceived as a system. And uh, the system is made of different parts. And those different parts are interrelated with each other to make a successful unit, a living unit. And among those uh, elements, there's uh, in the infrastructure, if we use Marxist terminology, there's the production, the way people get food, and there's the reproduction, the way people um, married, uh, get married and, and the kinship organization. And this reflects on the ideology, which is part of the what the Marxists would call the superstructure. Uh, and this ideology we can have a grasp on through uh, the symbols they use. And those symbols are not random. Uh, they are taken from the natural world and they have very uh, specific uh, items that uh, convey uh, a message that convey uh, an idea. Uh, and for example, uh, the pillars, uh, maybe the pillar actually is not a very good term because we're not sure if they support anything. I don't think they do. Um, we have good reasons to think that those pillars or those stele uh, represent, uh, they're uh, anthropomorphic, first of all, and they represent something about humanity. And but what about humanity? They're, they're not persons. Uh, because of the verticality, we can think that uh, this uh, vertical uh, position symbolizes the time scale. So uh, uh, a body uh, of uh, humans through time is nothing else but a lineage. And we have good uh, ethnographic uh, data to say this because in the Northwest American uh, Indians, uh, the totem poles are clearly said to be uh, a, a lineage of ancestors. Um, so uh, I'm going to, uh, focus on the second part, the reproduction part, because usually it's completely overlooked in the archaeology because we don't have direct data to uh, think about it. But um, the ethnology tells us a lot because there are certain rules that are shared by every society. Now, every society has a different culture, uh, just like every person is a different person. But there's uh, a universal structure that uh, human has bodies we all share. We all have a heart, we all have a mind, we all have lungs, uh, and this is the universal structure. It's the same thing for societies. Societies all have a system of production, a system of reproduction, and some sort of ideology to, to keep uh, the, the people together. And um, uh, what the uh, ethnologists have uh, talked a lot about is uh, that uh, every society shares the exogamic rule. Um, no one has uh, sexual relationships with first degree uh, kins, for example. And this is the, the, the utmost part of it. Um, there's another thing. Uh, 
anthropologists like Alan Barnard uh, and Levi Strauss with this famous uh, The Elementary Kinship uh, book. Uh, they've uh, found, um, the ethnographers have found that all the uh, hunter gatherer societies are all closed in. Uh, that's what Lewis was called the elementary type of uh, kinship uh, relation, uh, or they're restricted. Restricted is when uh, uh, two subgroups uh, exchange the sexual mates. Uh, when there are more than two groups, uh, it's called generalized. But the the mentality, the the main idea, is the same. Um, how do you do when you have a closed society and you want to respect the rule of exogamy? Uh, when I say a closed system, I, I want to say that uh, the community is by itself. There is the rest of the world, they're aware of it, but usually they don't even uh, consider other humans apart from their own group. They don't really consider them humans, really. Uh, well, you, you know this in, uh, in, in Greek, uh, in the ancient Greece. They, they, there are the Greeks and there are the barbarians. Uh, in Turkish, uh, when you're not a Turk, you're a yabancı. You're part of the wild world. And it's, it has nothing to do with uh, racism. It's a completely natural reaction of every human society on Earth. Uh, it's because uh, they need to find a way to exchange sexual mates. And how do they do that? Well, there's one universal uh, aspect of all those societies is that they're all uh, divided in at least two subgroups. It can be three uh, in, in Australian anthropology, we call about, when there are two, we call about moities, uh, when there are for its sections, when there are eight, its subsections, but they could also be odd numbers uh, in a restricted type, uh, the general type, uh, sorry. Uh, when a, um, well, because the whole idea is uh, when you belong to a subgroup, let's say A and B too, it will be easier. Um, the, the rule is you cannot have a sexual relationship of any sort within, uh, with somebody of your own group. You necessarily marry with someone from the other group. If you're A uh, and you become, you are A usually from your mother, we can be your father, but in the most original type of societies, it's probably your mother because uh, you know who your mother is. You're not necessarily sure by your father. But uh, you, you, you are A by your mother, you necessarily uh, marry with someone from the B subgroup. And B people do the same, they marry in A. Um, uh, and this is absolutely, uh, all ethnographers have been absolutely struck by how important was uh, kinship relations uh, among those societies. Personally, I've been very uh, impressed by how uh, people in Turkey have uh, made a difference between, for example, Dayu and Amja. And it's absolutely, it's, it's incredible. I mean, you cannot have uh, uh, somebody who doesn't really know who is, is Dayu and Amja. It's, it's, like, it's like your own name, it's, you, you're born with it. And it's very interesting because between a Dayu and an Amca in today's uh, Turkish society, there's absolutely no difference in terms of uh, legal uh, rights. If they're the same uh, physical bodies, uh, why does it uh, keep on going in the language? It is because once upon a time, in, in not a very distant time, so that it still keep on living in the language, it, it, it was very important because it showed you the cousins you could marry with and you had to marry with and those you, you absolutely could not. Um, so uh, this is not just about reproduction, this division of the society. It uh, um, determines the entire uh, way of conceiving the world. 
conceiving your own uh, place as a society within the world and uh, more importantly it uh, it determines the way you uh, are interconnected with the other um, individuals within the society um, uh, w when I say it reflects on the entire world, it's that uh, for people working on a, on a dualist basis, uh, like uh, a river is either A or B. Uh, a, a, a type uh, of uh, a, a tree species is either A or B. Uh, the moon, the sun is either A or B. Or and so it goes much beyond the, the reproduction scene. And it uh, reflects directly on the production in the way that a hunter, when he brings um, to the camp uh, the prey he has killed, he gives it to whom? To uh, his mother-in-law, because his mother-in-law necessarily belongs to the other moiety and to a different generation. So it's, it's the, the, the most um, differentiated per person that uh, gets the production. Oh, by the way, um, I talk about production, about hunter-gatherers, and it's uh, not the, the usual way of in the uh, traditional archeological terminology when we uh, say that food production is only about agriculture. No, uh, hunters and gatherers, they produce when they get food, uh, in a Marxist uh, perspective at least. So now, why um, all this? How does it, uh, how can we, uh, how does it matter for us? Um, the way that they divide everything into two. Well, we'll have a look at uh, the uh, Neolithic uh, symbolism. And um, what do we have uh, in the most um, uh, representative uh, example, that of Gobekli Tepe in the first layer, the PPNA, late PPNA. Uh, we have those uh, circles, and the circle, by the way, is not a random uh, shape. It's uh, usually in those societies, it's uh, conceived as a way to, um, to uh, mean uh, fertility, because it's, it's, it's the shape of a woman who's pregnant. Uh, I also read that it was a symbol of uh, women's sexual organs, but it's, it's more about fertility, really. Uh, in itself, uh, and what do we have in the right in the middle of those circles? Uh, and if they're in the middle, it's not random either. Uh, it's those two huge, uh, absolutely parallel pillars. What, knowing what we know now from the ethnology of uh, very early hunter hunter uh, gatherers. Uh, those I'm, I was talking about uh, are um, hunter-gatherers that do not know bows and arrows. Those are uh, the uh, Australian Aborigines. So they reflect uh, a part of uh, human society at its earliest stage, uh, really. And um, so we have those two parallel pillars. What are they supposed to mean? Uh, well, we can uh, say that there must be a connection between those two moieties uh, exchanging sexual partners at every generation so that the society reproduces itself uh, without too much trouble. Um, but there's probably a higher level of conceptualization. The, the, the capacity of conceptualization of those societies is completely underestimated. Um, maybe the side pillars represent the sections of the society. This is a hypothesis and we take it like this, but the, the two at the center, they represent an idea. They don't represent the reality, the social reality of those, uh, of those people. Um, um, and uh, we also have the uh, PPNB, 
uh, level in Gobekli. Uh, that's on the right side. Uh, and we still have those central twin pillars. Now we have four because they can maybe represent the, the, the actual lineages of the society. There may be less um, conceptualized. Uh, on the left, you have uh, Nevaluchori, uh, early PPNB and middle PPNB. And you have these communal buildings and right in the middle of it, those two pillars. Uh, maybe once again, the side pillars represent the different sections of the society, but the two pillars in the middle represent the idea of exchange. It's a concept. It's, it is detached from uh, the material world. Um, now, in uh, it's so this was the the Urfa area, the middle upper middle Tigris. Uh, but in the Tigris basin, we have the same things. Uh, in Chayonu, the three communal buildings from the PPNB level, they all have those uh, lines, and it's especially in the Terrazzo. Uh, well, they're chronologically uh, in the wrong order, but um, the in Terrazzo building, we have those two. Uh, parallel lines painted on the floor with a red color and it's not random either the red is symbolizes the blood and the blood itself in the ideology of hunter gatherers is divided in two absolutely interdependent uh, types of blood the, the female blood and the hunter's blood uh, in the ideology um, hunter gatherers uh, female uh, gather and uh, men uh, hunt, but on a psychological level, uh, men hunt, yes, but what do female produce uh, in compensation from the meat? It's children. And, and when a children uh, gets birth, he gets birth uh, in a, a, a flood of blood. And this blood is uh, conceptualized as completely different uh, and opposite from the, the blood that's dripping from the animal and that's, that was killed by the men. This is the reason why women do not hunt in those societies. It's not because they, are, uh, they would be uh, physically less uh, adaptive to hunting. They, they, they could very well be. But uh, in, in a, in a, uh, on, on a conceptual, uh, symbolic level, it, you, it is very important to make the difference. Now, uh, here we have. Uh, in Gusir, uh, in PPNA, uh, Tigris level, we have those two uh, parallel pillars in the middle of the circle. Uh, MPPNB Tigris uh, Basin. Uh, at Bonjour Kutala, uh, Erbil Kodash. Uh, thank you for all the people who uh, provided me the pictures. Uh, it, it was very nice. And also the uh, red line, uh, parallel red line painted on the floor. In Kermes Dere, Trevor Watkins was very clear that the two uh, pillars in the middle of the, of the building have no architectonic function. They do not support anything. They're made of clay. Uh, and they're absolutely symbolic. Uh, and uh, uh, very interesting, the, those pillars are, uh, the, the building was re uh, rebuilt several times and every time the, those two pillars are placed exactly at the same place. This symboli symbolizes the, uh, the, the lineage in time. Uh, in Jerf uh, al-Ahmar in Northern uh, Levant, we have those two, um, those two, I don't know if you see my mouse, but uh, those two half pillars and Daniel didn't know what they were. Uh, it's because they're uh, uh, probably th the same thing as those in Kermes de, they're absolutely symbolic. Uh, and uh, they, they made this plan, which is very interesting uh, with the, the completely symmetrical on the central axis and it is thought to be, though people, some people disagree, uh, that uh, it's a, a communal granary. And in, in the hunter-gatherer uh, ideology, it could be that uh, one moiety uh, produces and stores the grains for the other, which would 
completely makes sense with what I told you about uh, the hunter giving his prey to his mother-in-law. It's the same idea. Uh, and now we're left with uh, Chatalouk and it's uh, absolutely, uh, now we have those two pillars. Uh, you see the female figure, it's not a female, it's the uh, principle of reproduction. And what does it produce from, his, from her vagina? It's the bull. And the bull is the image of the society. The society represents itself as a male entity and it's the, the horns. The horn is a very clear, uh, it's an erect penis. It's the, it's the image of society. Society who sees itself as male, not because they are patriarchal so far. They, they will be in a, when they get completely um, agriculturalist. But here in hunter-gatherer type of societies, even if they have started uh, agriculture uh, since uh, not very long, um, uh, the, 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 the reproduction principle is female. So that's why the reproduction uh, principles uh, product is male. And uh, this reproduction principle uh, gets birthed by her vagina, but she eats by her mouth. And this is the very well-known um, object of the teeth, teeth uh, vagina. Uh, you, you, you get birth, but you eat by your mouth. It's the cycle of life and death. And how does it work? And why are the female figures, uh, legs and arms stretched out? They're stretched out to the two pillars. The two pillars, it's because it's A and B exchanging sexual mates that gives the, the society uh, a reproductive function. Um, and why, um, uh, those are all the dualist uh, places I saw. Oh, and this is uh, Neanderthal. It's, it's incredible. It's, it's, yeah. Okay, uh, Neanderthal, uh, 2,000 years, 200,000 years ago, you have, it's the, exactly the same uh, construction as Gobekli Tepe with the two piles and uh, the stalagmites. Uh, the iconography is the same thing, but I don't want to go further. Okay. Um, Oh, I have a uh, uh, YouTube channel, Kanun Mar, or the Hershey Achiklanio, the Borussons, Cedric Bodediye, Insan Olushumu, Insan Evrim. Teshikulash, Paul.